you know, we were thinking about it in terms of the script. We weren't thinking about it and thinking, oh, we're setting here something that people are going to reference for the future. That's <laughs> That wasn't our plan. Our plan was specifically for how do we deal with these things in the script. You know, it just so happened that as time has gone on, the things that were produced are able to come to reality now. And it, it's basically informed people on what that future might look like. I think we're going to have our own personal assistants that are going to know everything about our lives. And hopefully that will make our lives better. Jarvis is iconic. Today, we have the distinct pleasure of talking to the man behind Jarvis, Iron Man, and all of this incredible innovation in visualizing the future of computing on the silver screen. There's something super magical about this intersection of imagination and technology, and you're gonna to wanna to stick around for this. Hi, my name's Ian Dawson. I'm a visual effects uh, producer for the last uh, 30 plus years. I'm excited to be here to talk about my background and uh, the future of AI and AR and technology. I was working at a company called Prologue and we had been lucky enough because of my relationship with Victoria Alonzo having worked at uh, Rhythm and Hughes. She was the post producer at the time on the first Iron Man and there were about 50 shots that another visual effects company couldn't complete. It was very design oriented. It was basically all the screens and there was one kind of AR table, right? Where mm. he kind of sticks his hand in and holds up the, the first kind of Iron Man grip kind of uh, simulation. There was about 50 shots in that. We completed those, got those done. And uh, when Iron Man 2 came up, it was about how do we take that into, you know, what was in Iron Man 1 and a lot of stuff on screens and kind of take that into what might be 20, 25, 30 years into the future. Mm. We don't want to be so far into the future that it's not feasible to think that this might happen, but far enough to where people don't understand necessarily how that's going to become reality. So that was kind of the challenge. And, you know, there was basically this not blank pages in a script, but what does this thing look like? What does that future look like? There was Jarvis, this AI who was helping you, an assistant, but how is that gonna become reality in this film? So we had a, an amazing opportunity where we had about six months. Marvel paid us for six months to just come up with conceptual ideas, which was fantastic, right? That doesn't normally happen. So we had a team of probably say about 10 people at that time just coming up with uh, tests and ideas and uh, things that were related to what was in the script. You know, we were thinking about it in terms of the script. We weren't thinking about it and thinking, oh, we're setting here something that people are going to reference for the future. That's <laughs> That wasn't our plan. Our plan was specifically for how do we deal with these things in the script. You know, it just so happened that as time has gone on, the things that were produced are able to come to reality now. And it, it's basically informed people on what that future might look like. And films do that, right? You have Minority Report that's done that and, and other films along the way that kind of have looked into the future given people ideas of what that future might hold. But while you're doing it, you at least for me, and I think for a lot of the artists that were on there, we weren't thinking of it in terms of, you know, hey, we're going to influence the future here and what we're doing. We, we were just trying to solve the immediate problems. Danny had spent a lot of time really working out and thinking about what are his hand gestures that Robert Downey Jr. should mm -hmm. do. Because the thought was, okay, we need him to, to manipulate certain things. We had spent time right in the in the development doing that human interaction with graphics. I remember Danny, you know, we get there and we had at, on set and we had a meeting and Danny started to go through, you know, some of these gestures. Robert was kind of like, look, I, I act, you do visual effects. I'm going to do whatever I feel comfortable doing at that moment. And you guys are just going to have to work <laughs> of kind of course. around me, you know, and <laughs> luckily it, it all worked. The team, yeah. the team made it work. And uh, dare it I say it seemed ultimately made sense. We knew that the projection system doesn't exist. It was a holographic system. Headsets weren't even necessarily thought of as, you know, we were all referencing kind of VR and nobody was going to walk around with this big giant headset on, not being able to see their eyes and, right. and things like that. So everything was kind of based in this fantasy holographic world. It was about sort of how do we present that holographic uh, image in a real environment? How are you going to see it? How is it represented? It had to be a creative way to do that versus just solid objects 
sitting in there. So I think the team came up with, you know, this really interesting line artwork uh, kind of representation, kind of like you're looking at, a, you know, the geometry of a model, but not, right? It, it had more detail than that. Ilya, if you look at some of the screen graphics that were basically it was just like a glass plate and these things were somehow magically projected inside the glass plate. Ilya came up with so much detail in those graphics. It was mind blowing to see how much uh, detail and everything functioned, meaning it all had animation and it felt real. I realized, how do we take this into the real world? I mean, I, I knew of VR and I knew of AR uh, or at least things, interaction. Like on Minority Report, John Underkoffler was the MIT graduate student at the time, but um, he ended up making that in real life, not on glass, but on a projection screen and being able to move through data, you know, real quickly. So for me, it was like, I think we could do this in real life. And I was trying to convince the owner of the company that, you know, VR and AR is an area a new area within the company we should, uh, you know, delve into. I wanted to bring kind of that design sensibility from the visual effects and into the development side of things. Everything on the development side, a lot of times was being driven by coding, not by the creative drive uh, mm. and the creative vision. And so for me, I have kind of come from it from a view of let's get creatives to come up with the conceptual ideas of what we want to do. And then let's team them up with you know amazing developers who are open to hearing and listening to these design ideas there's always going to be a time money capabilities restriction but i think that driving that from a creative point of view is really really important and you can see kind of the love and creativity that's infused into it it makes such a difference. Are there some POCs you mentioned the work with the NSA? A, can you talk a little bit more about the work there? And B, uh, you know, are there other POCs that come to mind that you're really proud of? We sort of knew that there was something up in the enterprise space. We had got a call from a friend in the entertainment business that we had worked for, and they were now consulting for some people at the NSA, and they wanted us to do some UI interface work to help find needles in haystacks. You know, to me, that was kind of like the acknowledgement that, hey, there's this UI work that we created that was fantasy has a potential life in, you know, in enterprise, in the real world. And so for me, that became a big interest of mine. And I kind of, I won't say left visual effects because I was still doing work in it, but I left the company prologue and I kind of ended up focusing more on VR and AR work, just to see what was out there, see what the potential was. Yeah, to be honest, leverage, you know, the work that we had done in Iron Man to that career or to that space. It was so new that it was really about people trying to show their management what the capabilities were of, of these tools, of headsets and both in VR and uh, and AR. T-Mobile business unit, they, they have drone clients, right? They might be a drone flying over a pipeline looking for, for breaks, uh, could be a drone in a field doing something. And so they wanted to create this, uh, we called it kind of like the avatar tree table, but it was a virtual table and it had the three-dimensional buildings or city or whatever your environment was that you were gonna fly the drone in. And then you could plot on this three-dimensional map, the drone's flight path. And it would show you in each mm. segmentation of the flight path where the signal was coming from, what its strength was, and it would allow you to adjust the flight path of the drone based on the information that you needed. So if by the time the drone got to this point, it could transmit all the video that it had, let's say, captured over the last mm. five minutes. And if that was good enough, then you know you made your flight plan accordingly. The big thing about it was you could do this collaboratively from multiple locations. So people putting on a HoloLens, and the idea was that eventually you would get in 15 minutes, you know, it would be sent to the FAA, you'd get FAA approval, and boom, you could go fly your drone. So this was like a tool that T-Mobile Business was thinking about putting together so that clients could basically plan out their drone flights. And for Hershey's, they're a hundred year old company that was been trying to appeal to a younger audience. And so their whole exploration originally in, in AR was about how do I get 
grandma or mom or dad to connect with someone on a younger generation in their world. So grandma could buy, let's say, a $20 Hershey's Kisses coupon, and that would be sent in an email to their grandson or granddaughter. They could then go to the store, get a real package of kisses, and then point the phone at the package. It would recognize it, and all of a sudden there'd be this 3D message that would come up on the table that would be from grandma with a message that said, you know, happy graduation or something like that, right? The technology has gotten to a point where we were thinking more 25 years down the road. So maybe we're ahead of where yeah. we're supposed to be. But I got an opportunity to go up to, to Microsoft. They had showed me the headset Copilot. And cool. they had an ATV, a real ATV set up, put the headset on me, said, you know, talk to Copilot. You can point to things, you can do whatever. So I was like, what's this part? And they're like, oh, that's the carburetor, you know? <laughs> and I'd say, okay, uh, what part number is that? Copilot would give me the part number. And then I'd say, okay, how do I replace the carburetor? And it would literally take me through a step-by-step -step instruction, not only auditory, but visually. Basically it was Jarvis. They were excited that I was there looking at it. And I was more than excited to see those two worlds come together. And I have so many fears as well as I have amazing things, right? Generally for things that, you know, you could argue are good or bad, I think we're going to have our own personal assistants that are going to know everything about our lives. And hopefully that will make our lives better in the sense that information and everything will be brought to us based on what we like versus us having to always go search for it. Searching for it obviously will always be there as well because we're gonna want, you know, every day things change, but generally your virtual assistant is gonna be helping you with those things that you're interested in and, mm. and, and bringing that information to Almost you. Almost like preempting your needs. That's correct. You know, some people might think that's bad. I think that there could be great things about that. On the bad side, let's face it, every technology that's ever been created by man, there's been some form of bad thing that's been done by it, using it for bad. I'm not hopeful that the human condition is going to keep the bad from happening. We can continue to hope and educate our children and people and try to do that. When you kind of think about that future, is that is that exciting to you? Or, you know, maybe in the near future, you might be orchestrating a bunch of AI agents. They're people who have these very specialized skill sets but are they all going to be able to adapt to this new way? At some point, just AI is going to be cost effective. And I don't need $100 million to tell a story anymore. And I don't mm -hmm. need a studio to, distri to distribute it. You know, I've talked to some people who are funding films and stuff like that. And not many people are interested in funding over $5 million right now for a film. <laughs> Um, because they look at like a Nora that was $6 million and made yeah. over a hundred million and won the Oscar and glass half empty, glass half full. The glass half full side of me says anybody can tell a story now. It's all about what you can envision and what your story is. You want to do a big sci-fi kind of movie. You can do that and not need $50 million and you can tell that story. I think there's going to be more interesting stories told. I think we're going to be wanting more and more of those authentic experiences because right. we're not going to know what is truly a real thing and what is fake. I mean, fantasy and reality are blurring. I think the only way to combat that human wise, uh, other than, you know, legality is wanting that authenticity in those experiences. I love that. Go with to the other, ground truth, right? Reality. We know it's yeah. real, at least for now. Yeah, I mean, if, if I can go, to, yeah, I mean, if I can go to coffee with you and we're yeah. drinking coffee together, that's as real as it gets, right? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> you know, so, <laughs> so true. Uh, I think people are going to cherish that a lot more. But again, it's the blurring of those lines is is really critical in society and keeping society not from coming unwound.